Hello everyone, welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your curator, Kevin Adkisson, coming to you live from Saarinen House here on Cranbrook's Academy Way. Those of you who have been following along since the beginning know that I was last here in March with a Live at Five tour uh, with our new type of Live at Fives. I'm trying to do really focused studies on specific aspects of Cranbrook's history. And so today I thought that I would talk about an object that was not in Sarnen House uh, when they lived here in the house, um, but something that I moved here for an exhibition last year, uh, and that is a Cranbrook loom. Uh, and these Cranbrook looms are named after, of course, Cranbrook and the weaving workshop of Studio Loya Saarinen. Now, if you've been paying close attention to your email and your uh, Facebook notifications, you'll know that next Tuesday on July 28th at 10 a.m. and at 7 I am going to be doing a uh, lecture, a live virtual lecture from Saarinen House about Studio Loya Saarinen. Mrs. Saarinen was a sculptor in Finland and a gardener. She came to weaving later in life, uh, and she turned uh, this sort of challenge from George Booth, why don't you design and have woven uh, the rugs for your husband's buildings? She took that challenge, and instead of just weaving for Cranbrook, she turned it into a modern commercial design enterprise. Um, she had a few dozen Swedish weavers, over 30 looms, including 12-foot um, looms where she could weave or oversee the weaving of these massive rugs, like the one that I am standing on, uh, the so-called exhibition rug. And so Loya Saarinen, she was um, not really doing much of the weaving herself. She was overseeing the production of these rugs. And... The rugs that were woven here for Saarinen House were woven for the Cranbrook Foundation and they were paid for by Cranbrook to be permanent uh, fixtures here in the president's residence. Of course, the Saarinens would be the longest residents in this house from 1930 to 1950. And all of these rugs are hand woven uh, on Swedish sust. Tor Berglund immigrated just to work here at Cranbrook, and he made all the wooden furniture that we see here in Saarinen House, but then he also made Mrs. Saarinen and her weavers the looms that the woven on. I'm really sorry about the connection. I hope that it is not too bad on your end. Um, it is slightly stormy here. There is no internet at Saarinen House, and so I'm coming to you over the cell service, uh, and when it storms, Cranbrook loses cell service. So please be patient. Um, if it's too miserable for the cell service, sometimes if you come back and watch it later, it will be more smooth than it is live. But I hope that you can stick with me. I'll try to uh, keep it in service as much as I can. So we're talking about Mrs. Saarinen. We see her portrait here, painted by Aliel Saarinen in 1922. And she is working initially on these uh, rigid Scandinavian Swedish style looms made by Tor Berglund. When she watches her young Swedish weavers at work and she thinks these things are heavy, they're extraordinarily labor intensive, uh, that's her observations of how to make a better her observations on how to make a better loom came from watching very intently every day, focusing on this industry and seeing how to improve it. So I'm going to walk us step by step what makes a um, rigid, counterbalanced style Cranbrook loom. I should preface this that I am an architecture historian uh, by training. I am not a weaver, nor am I a weaving historian. And so um, if you are following along and you are a weaver and you question something I say, type it in the comments and I'll try to correct it later tonight um, uh, because my understanding here is all coming from books and reading up 
quite a bit about looms, but I am not a professional weaver. So she goes to John Bexell and she says, I think that we can make a more efficient way of balancing the harness. Um, and so when I sit at the loom here, do you see how there are these treadles down below? And when I press one of these treadles, it lifts one end of the harness. When I press, when I release the treadle, they balance again in their level. When I press the next treadle, this one that was up has now gone down, uh, and the one that was down is now up. And part of this balancing and how this was done is what Loya Saarinen helped to improve. And so it became much easier for a single uh, weaver to sit and uh, create the shed, which is what we weave through. And I'm going to do a weaving demonstration here in a moment. Uh, but first, let's finish the, the story of John Bexell. So Loya Sarnin comes up with that improvement. There's a number of other little tweaks that make a Cranbrook loom a Cranbrook loom, and it has kept evolving. But the first Cranbrook loom, and this is one of the earliest, is delivered to Studio Loya Sarnin in 1936. She immediately places an order to replace all of her looms with these so-called Bexell or Cranbrook looms. So she replaces all of the looms at the Academy, all of the looms at Kingswood, and all of the looms in her commercial studio, Studio Loya Saarinen, with her innovative Bexell or Cranbrook loom. Now, John Bexell himself, he was um, uh, from... He was from this little tiny town in the Arctic Circle in Sweden, um, Korstrak, uh, Sweden. There's population 300 people. He immigrated to Flint in the 1920s with his wife, Marie Bexell. And how he got in touch with Loya Saarinen was that Marie was actually one of her weavers. And so um, John Bexell makes these looms. He sees the potential and he starts making them for other weavers in the area. He gets the attention of the government and the Roosevelt administration. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was a huge supporter of American handicraft as a way of getting women out of uh, the Great Depression. <laughs> sort of... Uh, farm wives <laughs> create income. And so his first big order after Cranbrook and Loya Saarinen was actually with the Farm Service Administration, who placed an order for a few hundred Bexell looms. By 1945, he and his sons were making these professionally. The Bexell company was making the looms. And Loya Saarinen said, you know, you designed that loom with me for Cranbrook. Why don't you call it the Cranbrook loom? And the Bexell company made Cranbrook looms until 1977 in Flint, Michigan. Uh, at that point, they were bought up by another family company in Colorado. But Cranbrook looms, as both an official Cranbrook loom as a, and as a loom, are still being made. So they're still on the market. And they are really great for weaving rugs and for weaving tapestries. You'll see them all around the world. Um, as we look at the loom, the main frame here is called a castle. And what makes a Scandinavian style loom is to have the upright castle where most of the loom is actually hanging down as opposed to coming up from the ground or like a Persian style loom where you would actually have it tied to a wall and the frame would be resting across a floor. The loom starts with the warp fibers. The warp fibers are the ones that are running the length of your weaving. So uh, the rug in the living room are the rug that I'm standing on. The warp is the long end. So this is, uh, the warp is running this way on this rug. It is wrapped around the warp beam. And so you see this great beam and here are all the fibers of my runner before they've been woven. Um, you set this up on a warp board, which is a, a very complicated process, um, a very ancient process, how to set up a loom. But my goodness, it took Lynn Bennett Carpenter, the head of the Kingswood Weaving Department, and I quite a long time to get this set up. And then the warp runs through these lease sticks. And the lease sticks are integral to making a weaving work. And what you have here is every of your warp threads is going 
are down, up are down. And I could actually make a weaving with just the string and two leaf sticks. That is all you really need in order to be able to weave. So these were used in ancient Mesopotamia all the way through Greece and Rome. And this is the sort of most ancient part of the loom. And everything else is just to make the weaving easier and to help us get the patterns in and to make it an efficient uh, sort of modern industry. We're really looking at a, essentially an 18th century Swedish loom with modifications here in the 20th century. Then the warp threads come through these two harnesses. And on the harnesses, these are modern heddles. These are actually nylon. Uh, heddles are, already have the um, eye made into it. So the eye is where the warp is coming through, these little heddle uh, fibers. Sometimes you'll see metal heddles. Mrs. Sarn and her womb looms were using hand-tie cotton heddles, and that was a job that the young weavers, uh, or the most junior weavers would do, would be to pre-make these heddles. Because if you look at the size of what I am weaving here, it's pretty small. So if you think about a rug like this, or the more complicated rugs, you are using thousands of heddles per uh, weaving. So the heddles are holding in the warp threads, and you'll see when I'm across. Next we have the beater bar, and within the beater bar is the reed, and the reed is this sort of comb that holds all the warp threads in place. So what you want to do as you're doing the weaving is to have the warp run continuously without uh, tangles from the warp bar down at the bottom over the back, through the leaf sticks, through the uh, eye of the heddles in the harness, and then into the beater through the dents of your reed. Then you actually do the weaving here, and it all ends up wound on the cloth beam. And I'll show you how it works to actually wind and create tension, because the tension in this is what is going to make it possible to have a clear, even, beautiful weaving. So let me set my camera down so that you are able to see everything that I'm doing. I tested this out an hour ago and I think it's going to work for you. If it doesn't, you can file a complaint. Kid, that's a joke. Please don't complain. Um, though I do always Love feedback. So I'm sitting here on my bench. We've gone back to 1936. And this is called your shuttle. And you are going to throw shots back and forth. And a shot is just a single um, uh, weft thread. Your weft is running the short direction. or The weft is what you weave. The warp is rigid on the loom. And so I'm going to press one of the treadles, I have now created my shed, so half of the strings are up, half of the strings are down, and I throw my shot across, and so I have made a single weft, and now I'm going to pinch this end and pull the tension. I'm, I'm using a, a full cotton thread here, and so it has a lot of bounce. And if I don't pull it and get rid of that tension, I'm going to have a very loose and uneven salvage or edge to my weaving. So I pinch this end, I pull the tension out, and then I release the treadles, and now I have closed the shed, and my thread is locked in here. Now why did I have to keep it at an angle like this? Well, if you think about it, as we make the fabric, um, if I had simply woven directly across, eventually I'm going to really pull these edges in because I have to have slack within the weft because the thread has to go like this. It's going over and under every other warp. So now I can take my beater bar, which is really a misnomer uh, because we don't want to beat this fabric to death. If we were making a really tight weave, we would beat, but here we're just going to place. And you see how it picks up the weft, and then I place it on the next row. And so now you can see how uh, the 
thread or the string that I just wove is going over and under. I'll set this back in place. And now I will take my foot and I'm pressing the other treadle down. And so all of the strings that were just up, we then went neutral and now they're on the bottom. And so by pressing the other treadle, when I weave back the next direction, I am going across the top of all of the threads that I just went under. So I take my shot across, I pinch this end again, pull out the tension, release the treadles, and then I place it back down. I go to the next treadle, I go back across, and then presumably I do this all day, gossiping happily away in Swedish with my friends. Um, if I was doing a larger piece, I would absolutely have multiple people sitting at the loom, and we would be passing the, um, the spindle all the way down. So we would be running it through up to 11 and a half feet worth of work fibers. Now, I am set up here. Lynn set us up to weave a plaid. Um, and so what I am weaving is actually the pattern of the warp, which is this gray, two blue, turquoise gray, turquoise gray, all the way back to blue and beige. I am weaving that in the same direction now with the weft, and so it's creating a plaid. If we look back down on our cloth bar, um, maybe we can get a nice view. Oops, sorry. Um, maybe we can get a nice view of the plan that we're weaving next year when you see me walking around campus in the winter with this as a scarf you'll know what happened but do you see how i have created this really open weave so you can see the turquoise through the beige and then when it hits the beige it's created a solid pattern by leaving it open and not beating this to death i'm creating um, a sort of lovely open weave pattern now I want to show you um, how to change the thread, which is the most exciting and terrifying part. So what I've done is I've sort of woven to try and match this dimension. So I'm gonna do one more shot across, hold it in place, and I'm grateful to Lynn Bennett Carpenter, who taught me how to weave, helped me set this up, lit this loom from the Kingswood Weaving Studio. And I'm also very grateful to the Kingswood, Cranbrook Kingswood Upper School Teen Art Council, who helped me a couple of times with public events doing weaving here on the loom. So the sections when I unrolled this that looked really great were woven by the high schoolers. Um, and then the rest of it was woven by my staff of collections interpreters, the guides and I. So what I'm doing to change color is I just simply snip this thread and pull it all the way out. I don't have to do anything with that end. It's just held in through tension. And remember that we're mirroring the pattern of the warp. So we have, if we're starting on this end, we have turquoise, blue, gray, so we need two lines of blue. And using the same direction that I just wove across, I'm going to put a line of blue in, and we'll just sort of pull it again at an angle. We'll stop it here. Go ahead and beat that into place. I will say this has been set up for a year, and it's a little bit wonky, so if you're looking and cringing as a weaver saying everything's a little out of balance, that is kind of true. Um, now we're going to hold it in place again, get the tension out, beat it down, and now if we look closely at what we have done, um, do you see how there are two blue threads here and one here? I'm going to shoot back across here and then I'll snip it and you'll can, you can see what I'm looking for down here. So will make another shot across.
pull it at the ankle, feed it into place, and then I'll pull it a little bit out. It is amazing how tight it gets automatically. We'll cut this, pull the rest out, and then we can go back to our turquoise color. And so now we are back weaving the primary color, and we'll just make a start of it here, and then we can keep on keeping on. I will say, at one point we didn't realize, because there were so many people working on this weaving, and we had seven sections instead of six sections, and I did go back and unweave a couple of inches, because I knew it would bother me forever. And so now you'll just keep on keeping on. So that is, you'll see that just since we've been on the camera, we've woven from there all the way to here. So it's, it's faster than you would think. And I think if I did this every night, um, you know, the, you can see how, uh, even though you look at a rug like this that's 11 and a half feet by 24 feet and you think, how did they ever weave that? Uh, this would have taken about um, three and a half months for five weavers working full time, uh, which was 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. working next door at Studio Loya Saarinen. But if we look closely at this um, rug here, You'll notice that it doesn't quite look like what I am weaving. I am weaving a plain weave, and here there is this slightly fuzzy quality. And so how did we get that? Well, this is a, another Scandinavian technique. And so while I am weaving a plain weave, let me show you how we were, what Studio Loya Saarinen was actually doing. They would have, uh, the design of, the, of whatever they were weaving would have been hanging up here. So they would have had a, a sheet of graph paper here that would have had the design called out. The same graph paper that Loya Sarnin would use to design her rugs, she would then also use to design the flower layouts around campus because she was in charge of all of the gardens around her husband's buildings. And then they would have had these little bundles of yarn tied up and hanging down. They would have uh, sort of counted across the graph paper, pulled out the color that they needed, and they were making raya rugs, uh, which are tied rugs. And so you would count across the graph paper, and you would, depending on how expensive or how um, luxurious the rug was, you could take four warp threads, you could take six, you could take eight, and you would take the yarn and you would tie it in a lark's head knot directly onto the warp. And so you tie that there, you go, you get your next yarn, you get the next four warp threads, you tie it on here, and the high schoolers, they still make raya rugs. Uh, you know, if I was a master Swedish weaver, mine would all be even as I tied this across. They would also sometimes tie three threads at once. It really just depended on what sort of level of um, quality, stability, durability, um, how dense the, the pile would be. And so you can see, now that I have tied these on, uh, and they sort of can flip up either direction. And so I would tie all the way across, changing color to make my pattern. And then you would weave across with the weft still. You would beat it into place and you would have these rows of fur. And so those would hang off of the weaving until you get something. And it's a little easier to see with this tapestry um, where the signature feature of a Raya rug is this knotted edge. Um, and so the Raya rugs, which almost look like uh, animal pelts, that is the, the type of rug that Loya Saarinen was weaving. It's common in both, Scandinav in, in both Finland and in Sweden. And Raya rugs had an especial popularity uh, as part of the uh, Finnish national romantic movement and the sort of regional variations of the arts and crafts movement. And so this is a type of rug that became popular 
around 1898, 99, 1900, called a bench raya. It's a bit of a Finnish fantasy of what it was like to be in a medieval Finnish house. Uh, it's a furniture form that's not Swedish in origin, not, Scand uh, not Russian in origin, it's not German. And so it became very popular for um, Finnish homes that were Finnish nationalists who wanted to become independent from Russia to incorporate these bench rayas. Um, you'll see here in Sarnen House that there are actually two bench rayas back to back. This one is is more traditional where it comes off the wall, over the, the bench, and then onto the floor. Uh, that one is a very short pile. This one is a very long pile. And so you can see how the threads are popping off. And if we look at this one, which was a modern Swedish weaving, do you see how we're looking at the back of the knots? And so this is the design of the rug that would have come from the graph paper. And then on the other side, you see how that design is loose from the, from the knots that are sticking up. And so all of Studio Loya Saarinen's rugs uh, that are, were at Kingswood or the Academy were using this Raya technique. And so this is a Raya rug as well. It's just been walked on um, for 20 years here in Saarinen House and then 20 years at Loya Saarinen's second home and then for 20 years at Kingswood and now 25 years here as a house museum. But it has held up this whole time, which is kind of amazing. So the last thing that I want to show you, um, if, you have any other, if you have any other questions about the loom, please feel free to submit them in the comments while I try and move the camera. I want to show you what happens as you get further along in your weaving and you need to turn and retension the loom. So I do wish that I had a pair of my mother's gingham shears to use with the loom, but unfortunately I don't. Um, so once you are weaving, what happens as you weave this direction is that you're getting closer and closer to the beater bar. And so you have to have enough room in order to create a shed as you're weaving. And then you have to have enough room in which to beat uh, the weaving. So as we weave this direction, we need the entire cloth, all the warp, to move this way. And so we have these handy uh, knots, gears, on the side of the cloth bar. And so I turn this one uh, to create loose tension, but then I'm going to unwind the warp here. So I release it with this clip, and then I'll over-exaggerate it so you can see it. Do you see how the entire work is now uh, loose? So then I come back to this gear, and I turn the cloth bar. I turn the cloth bar, and I re-tension. So you see how as I turn it, I'm pulling the entire weaving this way and creating tension, give it one more turn. And so now the portion that I'm actually weaving is closer to this edge and I have more room to operate the beater. It's kind of amazing, all of this is pretty amazing. And then as you move the weaving along, these little sticks will fall out and you keep weaving until you have the entire finished product on that end. Yes, these are the official Sarnen House tour shoes. So thanks so much for following along with our uh, weaving demonstration today. I hope that you were able to see everything. Uh, it's a little tough to do a one-man weaving demonstration, um, but I hope that it was clear. If you have other questions, type them in the comments. If I don't know the answer, I will find an answer for you. Um, one question that you might have is, were all of the Cranbrook looms this sort of curvaceous and beautiful? And this is actually the only one that is at the Kingswood Weaving Studio that has these sort of curves and has the very um, stylized 
uh, harness hangers. And I'm not quite sure why this one is a different style. I don't know if it was meant to be this sort of test piece, if it's older, or if it was meant to be a show piece. I've not found it in any historic photographs, um, but it does have the numbering system that dates back to Loya Saarinen. And so I know that it is a, a Cranbrook loom, but it, it has this just these wonderful details um, and even the sort of over-articulated mortise and tenon joints um, that really give it this sort of arts and crafts beauty. The rest of the uh, Cranbrook looms tend to be more functional, more sort of um, uh, just angular. They don't, they don't have the beautiful curves. I did pull out, just to tempt you for my lecture next Tuesday, some historic photographs, uh, including showing the, the uh, largest loom, the 12-foot loom. You'll see in front of the four Swedish weavers that here is the exhibition rug that I am standing on, um, and they are working across the 12-foot loom. And you can see hanging in front of them, those are the yarns for the Raya rug. And so those are the different colors that they're pulling down to uh, tie the knots. This here is actually Marie Bexell, so it's her husband who was uh, making all of the looms, the Bexell looms. And then, of course, the products that Studio Loya Sonnen wove. So make sure that you go to center.cranbrook.edu and sign up for either the 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. Eastern uh, lectures on Studio Loya Sarnen. I'll be talking about the festival of the May Queen tapestry, the, one of the largest they ever wove, but also some of the smaller tapestries, like this amazing fish uh, hanging that Aero Saarinen designed that's now at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And after the Great Depression, uh, Loya really sort of shift gear, shifted gears from weaving massive rugs and hangings to making home goods. So if any of you from your grandparents or your parents have <laughs> something, um, very little of this type of material survives because she was having this woven and then selling it. So these are uh, examples of a Studio Loya Sarn in tablecloth and napkins, little handbags, um, or even pillows. And if you look closely at this photograph, um, she's actually displaying it on the bench Raya in the living room at Saarinen House, and she did also oversee the production of upholstery fabric. So that's a curtain material that she has draped on the bench and then the hand-woven pillows. And she uh, was really overseeing quite an enterprise, so just the physical inventory of all of her material. Um, this is a forgery that I made. This is not the original. Um, the original is at Cranbrook Archives. But we do have all of the um, records of everything that Studio Loya Saarinen produced with all of Loya's little handwritten notes. So uh, next week, um, if you've signed up for the lecture already, you'll receive on um, Sunday or Monday and again Tuesday a Zoom registration. You'll just click on the Zoom link, enter your password, and we'll start right at 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. Eastern with our first in a new series of events called Uncovering Cranbrook. This first lecture I am titling Studio Loya Saarinen, The Art and Architecture of Weaving, 1928 to 1942. Uh, you'll learn even more about Mrs. Saarinen, her remarkable commercial enterprise, and we'll see so many, a bountiful uh, number of archival photographs of what she wove, who she wove it for. Um, we'll learn some about the immigrant weavers who came to Cranbrook and who made this enterprise possible. Um, I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at Five tour. Not sure well where I will be coming from next Wednesday. Um, it's great to see you all again. I'll see some of you Tuesday. You can sign up on center.cranbrook.edu, and I'll be back here on Facebook Live next Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Thanks so much. Be safe. Wear your masks, and see you next week.